Welcome to this discussion that we're having today. I am Erica Broom and I'm director of the Ira F. Brilliant Centre for Beethoven Studies. And I'm delighted today to be talking to Laura Tunbridge, Professor of Music at Oxford University. So um, let's get started. Um, Laura, your book is called Beethoven, A Life in Nine Pieces. And it does what the title says. It chooses nine pieces by Beethoven and it talks about Beethoven's life with those pieces as a kind of way in. Um, so for those of you who have not yet read the book, uh, the pieces are the Septet, the Violin Sonata, the Kreutzer Sonata, Opus 47, Symphony No. 3, the Choral Fantasy, the song Andy Galipta, Fidelio, uh, the Hammerklavier Sonata, the Misa Solemnis, and the String Quartet, Opus 130, um, which is a sort of fascinating array of pieces. There must have been some hard decisions when it came to deciding what, what went in and what got left out. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, so I was asked to write a, a book about Beethoven for the anniversary, and the big question was actually how on earth do you go about writing a book um, about Beethoven, another book about Beethoven. Um, and what I realized quite quickly was that I, it wasn't going to be a huge, big, thorough biography in the way that uh, previous volumes have been. They exist already. So then is there, how do you go about writing a, something which introduces the life and works that gives ways into um, what Beethoven did throughout his life, but that makes it quite clear that you can't cover everything. So in some ways, the idea of never really being able to tell the full story of somebody's life was helpful to me because then I said, well, actually, if I do then just select a sample, um, how can I do that? And I decided also quite early on that what I wanted to do was to have pieces of music at the center of how I told the story so that it was not simply saying what happened in his life, but also trying to give some insight or introduction to works of his that I thought would be interesting. So um, I then started thinking, well, actually, if I am going to only pick a sample of pieces, um, obviously, which pieces do you choose? And there are already volumes which are dedicated to all of the nine symphonies. There are studies of the genres in which Beethoven composed. And I thought, what happens if you actually mix up the genres that are covered in this book? So you don't only have symphonies um, or sonatas, but actually try and give a, a sense of the range of Beethoven's output. And then actually in terms of coverage, I decided that I wouldn't look at the childhood particularly, but actually try to go from Beethoven's um, sort of first real public success, which I think you can probably say is the septet, which is why I start with that piece, that here was a, a work that saw Beethoven uh, becoming popular in Vienna in a well-known name. Um, but there's also that fascinating aspect of it, which is that it's a piece that we don't know terribly well today. So that then gave me a starting point to think about how Beethoven created his reputation and how his reputation has been made since. So I had various sort of angles to help me limit what I was trying to do within this biography whilst also covering quite a, a wide range of music and a number of decades. Yeah, I have to say one of the things that I really enjoyed about reading it was that it made me go and listen to some music because, um, you know, I don't know the septet that well. It's one of these pieces that you kind of hear occasionally. But, um, you know, you could have you could have talked about the first symphony and then I would have been much more familiar with that music. Um, yeah. And the song Andy Galipte, I mean, it doesn't even have an opus number. You know, it's so yeah. minor. Yes. And that. I find really interesting as well, which pieces have got opus numbers and which are the pieces that we know and actually how much of Beethoven's output are we really familiar with today? Because even a Beethoven expert like yourself, there will be pieces that you don't listen to all the time. And so how have those decisions been made and why have certain things stuck around and other things become fashionable later or become better known later? Um, so it was all those kinds of questions that guided me. Yeah, I'd like to ask you as well, it's interesting that you mentioned that you missed out the childhood um, because, you know, the way you tell the story, which is in these slices, um, you miss 
or what what you can't do in that kind of way of telling the story is to give the the background in a in a linear narrative um but what we do get is a really rich kind of spread outwards from a particular moment um i just wondered could you tell us a little bit about that and the process of thinking about history in that way rather than as a as a narrative i mean one thing i really wanted to explore was what it means to write a biography of a a great artist and the tendency biographers have to focus on that one person and so what i wanted to do was to try and broaden the context for what Beethoven was doing so that it's not only about him and seeing him as somehow unique although obviously there's lots of things about him that are but as somebody who was also working with his the people of his time working with the technologies of his time and explaining in some ways as much as we can know it aspects of everyday life that shaped what he was able to do as a musician and so that sense of Beethoven um, as being a, a man of his time, I suppose, is what you would say, um, I thought was quite important. And although that obviously is it within the biographies, if, if it is something which is very much focused on a blow blah blah account of what happened within his biography, some of those wider contextual questions um, are harder to bring up. So in some ways, this different structure allowed me to delve into some of those issues. Yeah, and uh, another thing that I'd like to ask you about is building off that idea about biographies generally being all about the person. Um, your book ends with Beethoven's death and the discovery of these two unsent letters in his estate. One is the Heiligenstadt Testament, which he wrote in 1802, which was a kind of personal outpouring about his deafness. And one was the famous letter to the unnamed woman uh, known as the letter to the immortal beloved. And it's interesting that you bring them in right at the end because it's like you're telling us that th that story doesn't begin until after Beethoven's death. Um, you know, and your chapter on the Eroica Symphony doesn't begin with the Heiligenstadt Testament, which a lot of other biographies do. Could you tell us a bit about that? Um, it's partly because I think it's so interesting that these two letters that we hang so much on now weren't documents that people were familiar with during Beethoven's lifetime. And throughout the book, I was intrigued by thinking about all of the things that we've discovered about Beethoven since his death, but that his contemporaries simply didn't know, and the very different images that his contemporaries had of him. So thinking about actually when things came into the public domain, I think is really helpful historically to try and work out when certain ideas begin to circulate and when they become really influential. And then you can start seeing how an artist's reputation is formed, not necessarily by them, but by sort of time passing and by information coming along. And also trends in how people think of artist biographies and the lives of artists. If you think about romanticism, um, that has a very different view of what an artist was than what the late 18th century, at least in musical terms, was thinking about. So it frees you up in some ways um, to think about actually how all of this, the stories about Beethoven have been put together, how influential they've been, but also to think about how they were, when they came into being, I think is actually really illuminating. And so in some ways that allowed me to, um, to have a freer approach to how I told the life. Yeah, and I, I find that it also, for me, opened up a new way of thinking about those biographical documents as well, because we're so used to slotting them into the biography of Beethoven's life. And by bringing them into the, the biography of biography, you know, so you, you, you're sort of telling a story about how we form the image of Beethoven. But what you do with the letter to the immortal beloved is you put it in the context of romanticism and literature and love letters. And um, that I thought was just, a really nice perspective on that letter. Um, so you, you can actually, would you like to just share a little bit about that portion of the book? Yeah, so um, one thing that strikes me about the letter to the immortal beloved um, is actually its it syntax, the way it's written and all those exclamation marks and dashes. And I mean, they happen elsewhere in Beethoven's letters, but not quite so much, not so extravagantly. And so you can say that that's the outpouring of emotion and this is a really heightened 
a piece of writing, which obviously it is, and maybe it does signal that it's heartfelt, but it also makes it look really similar to the kinds of letters that, say, Goethe's Werther writes in his novella about Werther, and that's obviously a hugely important and popular text at the time. And I think it is something where quite often the way that we express ourselves romantically or in other ways is informed by literature, film, at least nowadays, um, and our ideas of what romance is and how to convey to somebody our love for them is very much formed by those sort of experiences. And so I thought it was actually quite interesting to read The Immortal Beloved letter, not simply as something to do with Beethoven and whoever um, it might have been addressed to, but actually thinking about the process of writing love letters more generally and actually seeing that particular aspect of his work um, and his letters in that way, I found quite intriguing. Because um, we do that with the music all the time and we say, well, his influences come from Mozart and Haydn or whoever. Um, so why would he not also be influenced by what was going on around him in terms of writing more generally? Yeah, and you're a, you're a leader expert. So, <laughs> and you've written a book on the song cycle, Andy Fernigalipta being one of the first um, song cycles. Why didn't you choose that? <laughs> Why did you choose this little tiny song that's about a minute long? Um, there was, I was being a, a little bit um, strict with myself in thinking, well, I want to make it just about one piece and does Andy Fernig, and, but then I, that's a little bit tricky because I have whole symphonies in there. Um, I also quite like the idea that you have songs which are about similar themes. And I also thought it was important to talk about, well, publication and how some of these pieces come into being and what it means to have an opus number or not. Um, and I think song, I mean, one of the things I find fascinating about songs is that they are so small scale and slippery in some ways that they give you access to a kind of music making that the big public histories and big public genres don't give you um, such insight into. So the idea that he could, that even Beethoven who said he wasn't that interested in writing songs was still producing a lot of them and quite often in quite personal context setting poets who he knew or using them as ways to be, be trinkets or dedicated to people he knew. And so it provides access to a particular kind of um, his work and output that I think is actually sometimes overlooked in favor of these bigger pieces, even Andy Fernigalita, which is interesting because it is a, a genre where he really does have significant creative um, influence over actually what it means to write a song cycle. What happens if you look at the smaller songs instead and those sort of minor works of Beethoven can sometimes give you insight into the larger works as well. Well, let's talk about one of the larger works then. So um, the Eroica Symphony, um, mm -hmm. which is a work that entire books have been written about and it, it's um, it's one of the pieces you you chose in the book. Um, I mean it must have been a big challenge to approach that piece in the and tell try and tell the story the way you did here so can you talk a bit about the challenges there with the kind of richness of um, literature on this piece? Yeah. I mean the challenge is that there is so much written about it and it is a very familiar piece that people have views on in terms of how it should be interpreted and what its meaning is. I mean, you know this better than anyone, Erica. So um, in terms of familiarity with um, his working methods, I was, I needed to, I wanted to write about one of the symphonies and the question of which symphony that should be is obviously hugely loaded. I knew that I didn't want to write about the Ninth Symphony, um, partly because I was curious to see what happens if you tell Beethoven's story without having a dedicated chapter um, on the Ninth Symphony. And then the Eroica raises so many questions again about actually how we write his biography and how we think about meaning within his music. Again, you can see these shifts in reception in terms of what kind of heroism people are hearing in this work. And the factionalization of critics as well um, about who um, is pro Beethoven, who is contra when it's first um, performed. And the other thing I found the Eroica was really interesting for was to think about performance practices in the sense of what it meant to be able to, to rehearse this piece over um, more often than um, symphonies like that generally were, how certain orchestras took it up and actually really deliberately practiced it because they wanted to get to know this music better. 
and that whole side of the importance of performance and performance practices for Beethoven and the kind of music he was able to write, I found was really uh, significant in thinking about the Arabica. Um, so those were the sorts of things that I wanted to, to pull out there, but it's a challenge because this is a piece that is so, so familiar and so well written about. I want to ask you about your um, decision not to include the ninth. So it sounds like that's something that you, it was a deliberate decision. Was that a decision you took early on? Yes, actually, that was one of the things I knew that I didn't want to do. Um, partly, again, going back to if I was taking as part of my principle works that were um, received in certain ways during his lifetime. I was interested in that whole discussion around actually how successful the Ninth Symphony was and how quickly it was picked up or otherwise, and also people's attitude to the choral finale. Um, but I also think when writing a biography as, or a life and works sort of study, uh, there are some pieces, I mean, like the Eroica and certainly like the Ninth Symphony that have so much written about them um, that sometimes it's they overshadow everything else and everything becomes about the Ninth Symphony. And so what happens when you take out a major work like that and what kinds of things come to the surface that you would otherwise wouldn't pay so much attention to. So that was the reasoning, but it was quite an early decision. Um, and it wasn't entirely just chicken and out. It was partly, you know, wanting to think about actually the pieces that have entered the repertoire after Beethoven's death more substantially than what were familiar during his lifetime. Yeah, and on the subject of um, pieces that enter the repertoire, you don't talk about the ninth, but you do talk about the choral fantasy, mm -hmm. which often gets viewed as a sort of precursor to the ninth in some ways, but definitely a lesser one. You know, so that's a piece mm -hmm. that uh, history hasn't looked very favorably upon. It's seen as a kind of fairly trivial, um, not to be taken very seriously kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, so how much did value judgment play a part in your decision to talk about different pieces? Do you mean my value judgment? Yeah. Um, actually, one thing I should say first is that I do talk about the ninth, it's just in passing rather than having a whole chapter um, devoted to it. Um, I suppose value judgment in the sense that I wanted to test what it what those values were and actually who was making those judgments. And the reason for the choral fantasy in part was because it has a connection to the ninth, but also because the big concert at which it was premiered and that it was written for and the whole hybrid nature of that work is something that I find really interesting um, in terms of Beethoven trying to do a sort of a, a piece in some ways that gathers together the whole huge program. And that also allows a glimpse into the importance of improvisation and piano fantasy as well. And actually I have to say, I mean, in terms of pieces that you get to know more, I'm really fond of the choral fantasy, um, having spent quite a lot of time with it. Um, it is a piece that actually I think can be really fun to play, um, but also is something that has a lot going on within it that I find um, really quite interesting to think about. So why is this something that never really caught on? Obviously it's odd, um, but I think maybe that's part of its charm. Um, are there any other, are there any, discoveries that you made while writing this book have you changed your opinion about anything or made new discoveries as you uh, were in the process of researching and putting this together there was lots of contextual stuff which I found really interesting about I mean about the financial situation the economic situation I wasn't so aware of um, things that you that come up when you're writing something which sort of touches on issues of cultural history like but there are things that didn't make it into the books that I found really interesting, like the fashion for wearing boots or not indoors. Um, so that side of things sort of enriched my sense of what was going on around Beethoven. I found actually spending more time with the letters and with the many, many other biographies that have been written about him and the kinds of things that he spoke about in the conversation books and the kinds of bad jokes he made, all of that, in some ways fleshed out my image of the of the composer. Um, I didn't always like him more for it, but on the other hand, it did make him sort of come to life more for me. Yeah, and um, something I didn't mention when I read out your list of um, works is that each chapter has a one word tagline um, 
So chapter one is success. That's around the septet. Chapter two, friends. So, you know, you've quite clearly chosen a theme and, and chosen a work and kind of tied the two together. Um, I want to jump straight to friends um, because this is something that I think you have, have tried to have told slightly differently from other biographies and taking the focus away from just Beethoven and his life. Um, and the focus on his collaborations and friendships, particularly with other musicians, um, being quite different from the way we think of Beethoven as a kind of lone artist, um, you know, breaking boundaries by himself. So can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it's really obvious when you think about the way that Beethoven worked and who he was writing for and the circles in which he moved, that other people were always important to what he was doing creatively. I mean, he needed them as other performers to actually bring his works into the world when he wasn't just playing them himself, but also that they could influence him. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's just actually realizing what happens in the creative um, process. It doesn't diminish his, um, his genius in any way. Um, but I found it really fascinating that he does have these really strong relationships um, with his contemporaries, with musicians in Vienna, or in the case of the Kreutzer Sonata with someone like George Bridgetower who arrives and they spark up a friendship and they fall out with each other, which Beethoven quite often did with people. Um, but there was a sense in which that was a stimulus for him to compose a piece or at least to complete a piece. Um, and it was obviously sort of enjoyable and exciting and a big part of his life and a reason why he was writing music up to a, in some ways. Um, and you can see those relationships continuing throughout his life. I mean, obviously he does become more isolated um, in later years, but there are still people around him and he's still very dependent on other people for practical matters, but also um, in order to play his music, in order to think about music, um, to have access to others. And the collaborative process, I think, is something that tends to be overlooked by the way that we portray someone like Beethoven as being this lone figure who sometimes was, somehow was able to do everything without concerns for others. And I think that just is wrongheaded um, in terms of how we think of these kinds of creative people. Yeah, Beethoven's life is so full of these rich anecdotes and stories and um, people, you know, the business with his family and his nephew and his love letter. And of course, the music, there's so much there and you've had to choose only nine. Um, it, is the kind of biography you've written, is it particularly well suited to Beethoven, do you think? Is there a kind of reason why biography and music work together in a particular kind of partnership? I mean, it does seem possible to tell stories through Beethoven's music um, in a way that I think um, is probably true of a lot of other composers, but I think because the biography is also so well known and so well sort of trampled in some ways that it, they are, there are a lot of stories and images that people are very familiar with. And that means it's somehow ever present. It's very hard to talk about Beethoven and not bring some of those life stories in. Um, and I think because of the way that we tend to think about music and musicians, that's probably true of others, but maybe the stories aren't quite so grand and maybe they're not quite so well known. Whereas with somebody like Beethoven, you do really have that sense of those sometimes myths, sometimes historically accurate um, tales being associated um, with the pieces. And I find it really interesting um, to try and sort of tease some of those things out and work out where the information is coming from and how it's affected the way that we hear this music. Because actually at a certain point you think, well, actually what happens if, can, can we get rid of these stories? Actually, would we want to? But if we did, what is it that would happen to this music? Would it diminish its aesthetic power, the actual musical power of it? Is that what we're actually listening to or thinking that we're hearing some kind of struggle? Whereas actually, if we didn't know that story, um, maybe we would think about and appreciate Beethoven in a very different way. That's really fascinating. Um, can we talk a little bit about the Beethoven anniversary year? So here we are 250 years since Beethoven's birth and uh, major celebrations planned all around the world, um, hugely disrupted by the pandemic. Can I just ask you, how has your Beethoven year been? Um, it's been a curious mix. I mean, because I think in some ways, a lot of things have stopped 
and festivals that were supposed to be happening and I mean, conferences and all of that. Um, but I think it's partly to do with technologies. In some ways, there's been a broadening out in terms of access to people. Like I can talk to you now um, and this probably wouldn't have happened in a matter of course that we wouldn't have thought of it necessarily unless you were actually there. So it's a curious mixture of being immensely frustrating and depressing in all kinds of ways that you can't hear live music at least um, as you would have wanted to. But it has opened up access to a wider range of people and approaches and maybe also in some ways, um, rather than having this very um, grand concert series, say, of all the symphonies, are obviously not, not things that are going to happen at the moment. Um, but what you do get, at least is happening a lot here, are people taking the arrangements and adaptations and performing bits of Beethoven and performing them in unusual circumstances. And in some ways that's been quite liberating to actually give some kind of insight into different performance practices and attitudes to Beethoven, but also maybe not making him into the monolith that he could be if actually what we had was cycle after cycle um, of symphonies. So it's been difficult and it's certainly not the year that I envisioned when it was January and I thought my book was coming out um, and it has changed things in all kinds of ways, but it has also been quite interesting to see how arts organizations have adapted and how there's still in lots of ways an appetite for, for listening to music and to talking about it. And do you think you could predict what will be the major takeaway from this year for Beethoven particularly, for Beethoven scholarship and Beethoven appreciation, do you think when we look back, you know, on the 2020 anniversary year, how will our perceptions have changed or developed? It's interesting in terms of, I mean, there've obviously been a lot of books that have come out this year and that actually quite a number of those are more about interpretations of the life and a sort of very self-conscious idea of how we write about Beethoven. And maybe that was inevitable, um, that that would be this the kind of period that we're in, in terms of Beethoven scholarship. Maybe actually in terms of discussions about classical music and society and race relations and all of those kinds of things, we do actually kind of need to revisit um, how we think about writing um, about these figures and actually playing and performing and presenting them as well. Um, that's obviously part and parcel of what's happened in 2020 and I think is actually a hugely beneficial discussion to be having um, and can actually help us think of lots of ways of invigorating and reinvigorating um, how we engage with Beethoven. Wonderful. Oh, it's been so great talking to you um, about your fascinating book and uh, exploring some of these ideas in a bit more depth. Um, I'd like to invite questions now for Laura um, from people we have uh, present. We have 123 people here. So just um, in terms of logistics, I would like to ask everyone please to keep their questions short. Um, no paragraph long questions, please. Um, so just a reminder, if you would like to ask Laura a question, please type in the chat, type the word question, and then type your question after it. And we actually did have some advanced questions that uh, came in by email. Um, so we'll put some of them to you as well, but I see that we already have our first question here. Um, and the question is, what about Fur Elisa? Well, what about it? Um, is, I mean, there are pieces that are really, um, famous and well-known calling cards for Beethoven. And actually what's interesting about them is that they weren't, they're not major pieces, but they've become very famous. And so I think it's quite a nice example of the way in which you can have, what well, you might think of as small scale minor works perhaps, but they have a story attached to them. And for that reason, they kind of enter into the, into the consciousness of many people. And of course, it's also an important piece because so many people play it when they're learning as well. Yeah, it completely ties into your point because that piece didn't actually get published until the 1860s. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, most people in Beethoven's know, lifetime didn't know it. Actually yeah. posthumous sort of discoveries in some ways. Um, uh, okay, for Elisa, question, why nine pieces? Um, I had to choose a certain number and nine seemed quite good. It was slightly evocative um, in terms of Beethoven and I guess his nine 
completed symphonies, um, which is maybe why I was drawn to that. Um, yes, but I mean, it, it could in some ways have been more, it could have been less, but nine seemed like a, a reasonable number to do. Quite Beethoven-y number. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> okay, next question. Do you connect different biographical accounts of Beethoven and the various methods of approaching his life with changing approaches to performing his music? Yes, I think you probably can um, in terms of actually attitudes towards his life and works, how closely they connect, ideas about what's romantic in his life, um, and actually the kind of drama of the music maybe being something that could be drawn out. Um, but also, I mean, the sort of music industry of biography writing and performance practice is obviously changing a great deal um, through this period. And I think there are ways in which um, performers' attitudes towards playing his music um, and listeners' attitudes towards li hearing it and what they hear within it um, go hand in hand. So I think it's really important to have that performance culture in there as well. Next question. Did the broad audience for the book change your approach to telling the stories? Uh, and also, is it quick translated into other languages, including Dutch? This is from Annelies Andries. Yes. Um, in terms of whether it affected what, how I told, because it was for a general audience, one of the things that was interesting for me writing it was that I, I knew it was for a general audience, but I also knew that I wanted to write about the music and to try and evoke the music in a way that would encourage people to go away and listen to it. But as a, as a musicologist, quite often the, the charge against us when we write about music is that we use such arcane terminology that nobody can understand what we're actually saying about the music. So trying to find a way which was sufficiently clear um, to be comprehensible by somebody who doesn't have a specialist background, um, but that also says something about what the music is actually doing uh, was quite an interesting thing for me to have to try to do. Um, and what was the last bit? It was about translations. Yeah, tra uh, it's quick translation into other languages. So the fact that it was translated quickly into other languages, did that change yes, the way you... Dutch, um, yeah. Which was fantastic. Um, and uh, yes, and we'll see if it gets translated into any others. Um, but yes, now that's really nice. And it was a really interesting process to be translated as well and to have some back and forth with uh, the translator about what I'd actually meant or what actually translates well. What languages has the book been translated into? Actually, it, it, only into Dutch. So far. English and Dutch. What and an American. interesting hearing. <laughs> hearing. <laughs> okay, next question. Have you examined Beethoven's ninth vis-a-vis -vis the Congress of Vienna? Um, there's this, there's a, a lag there, isn't there? Do you mean actually is a suggestion then that they would... Um, I mean, the ninth is there's a, a time gap between them. So you could think about um, different kinds of large scale works, um, the inclusion of choral music and the importance of that, um, but as a direct connection, no. Congress of Vienna, I thought about slightly different works because of the 1815 um, situation. Yeah, it com comes up in your Fidelio chapter along yeah, with yeah. Wellington's yeah, and victory and a bunch of other things. Yeah, yeah, which is already a kind of, um, yeah, I mean, that's that's something we don't have time to talk about, so read the book. <laughs> um, next question. Uh, when did Beethoven write out the piano part for the choral symphony since he improvised it at the first performance? Oh, gosh. Uh, do, do you know the answer to that? When he wrote down the, the piano, piano part. The yeah. Um, the, I think the choral fantasy, I guess. Yeah, I'm yeah. actually not entirely sure of how. Yeah. My impression was probably quite soon afterwards, or maybe he just kind of remembered. I don't know, but I don't know the dates. Yeah, I don't know either. Um, so, okay, next question. Do you think there should be a new cataloguing of Beethoven's music, given what we now know about all his pieces? I don't think a new catalogue would necessarily help. Um, I think actually exploring the catalogue a bit more thoroughly and getting to know some of the repertoire that isn't so familiar today would perhaps be uh, more useful. Yeah, and there is a, there is a newish catalogue in uh, mm -hmm. 2014, which uh, addressed some technical questions like which works did Beethoven actually write <laughs> yeah. and which ones are by other people. Um, 
but yeah, uh, that's a super interesting thought. Oh, question here. Are you a musician? If you mean like, do I play? Um, I, I, I do play the violin um, and I enjoy playing quartets very much. So, so yes, and that's actually an important part of my current project, which is about string quartets. So, so yes, I am. Uh, okay. Uh, next question about uh, Beethoven and Haydn. How was Beethoven's relation with Haydn as a teacher? Did he learn quite a lot? Do we know which strategies Haydn used as a teacher? Oh, um, somebody else is better placed to answer this in detail um, than me. I mean, he, I think from what I remember, um, what he said about it was that he didn't learn that much. Um, and I think they had a slightly rocky relationship. On the other hand, Haydn was obviously a huge influence over Beethoven um, in terms of the types of music he composed and how he went about it. So yes, um, but there are in-depth studies of that. Yeah, indeed. And it's a complex, it's another kind of biographical story and it ties into the, the narrative of who inherits which kind of music tradition, which um, your book tells a slightly different story um, going kind of out from the works. Um, where do you wish Beethoven studies to go next? Um, I think there's a lot to be done with, uh, which is being done. Um, in terms of contextual work um, and thinking about Beethoven both in his own time and what was going on around him um, and again doing more to get away from this idea of only focusing on him as one lone figure um, and the work that you're doing and that Fabio who asked the question is doing um, that sense of kind of broadening out um, our idea for the context of Beethoven both in his own time and actually subsequently as well um, and I think there is already a lot to be done with being done with reception and performance practices, but I think that's something that seems to be really fruitful in terms of what people are doing at the moment. Um, okay, next question. How important was Beethoven's relationship with his sponsors on his originality and creativity? And is this discussed in your book? Yes, um, it is something that I talk about in the book because I'm really fascinated by Beethoven's relationship with his patrons and also how um, the kind of financial, the economic side of making a living as a musician during that time is important. But that's not only to do with the sort of mercenary side of it, it's also to do with what happens creatively and actually how certain people facilitated Beethoven um, to be able to experiment, to be able to not have pressures on him that meant he could create more freely. And I think that's a really important part of what made him such a successful figure in all kinds of ways. So yes, it does feature quite a lot in my book. Yeah, I, can I ask a follow-up question to that? Is just do you, when we talk about music history, so much of it is composers. And um, do you think we need to pay more attention to sponsors and uh, oh, other yeah. people and how I mean, you... Yeah, in lots of ways. I and mean, what I was saying about looking at the context is that it's thinking about music making very broadly um, so that it's not just composers, but it's performers, it's printers, it's sponsors, it's audiences, it's piano makers. Um, all of these things can contribute to what happens and what we think of as being music history. And I think um, the more we can embrace that, the better. Great. Uh, questions are coming in thick and fast. So um, is it true that Beethoven called his last quartet his best work? Um, I think he might have done, but he might have also called the next one the best one as well. Um, his sort of last, common, his, yeah. Yeah, 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 different not, points. Not the only pieces that he claimed great things for. Yeah, I think the Eroica gets a claim, yeah. Misa Solemnis, yeah. you know, depending. Well, you know, there's a lot to choose from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, next question. If you could ask Beethoven one question, what would it be? I can't think of a good answer for that. <laughs> um, I'd like back. to ask him about some of the things uh, that he wrote in the conversation books, because we have these amazing conversations yeah, yeah. between Beethoven one other, and one other person, but we don't have Beethoven's responses. So occasionally you get someone asking Beethoven a really super interesting question and we don't have his answer. That drives me crazy. Um, yeah. 
there's yeah there's at least one where where someone's asking him something about the music about the late quartet so why did this and then the next thing they say is what an interesting answer (laughs) (laughs) okay yes that's the thing you need to know Yeah. yeah okay um next question Um, did you address Haydn's reaction to Beethoven's Opus 18? No, I didn't. I didn't talk really about Opus 18, partly because I'm starting with the septet and partly because when I talk about quartets, I talk about the later quartets. So, yes, that doesn't feature. Um, technical question, where can we buy the book? Um, and I can give the answer to that. Amazon, Yale University Press, um, lots of different places. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Hopefully, yeah, just a reminder, it's called Beethoven, A Life in Nine Pieces. So I'm sure you'll be able to to find it. Um, Okay, I'm looking for more questions here. Um, Janice, could we have a question that was emailed to you? If you could type that into the chat. I'll do it right now. do you think there is a possibility that Beethoven was left-handed and for religious and social reasons, this has been suppressed? Um, I don't know and I don't know. <laughs> um, I know that there were um, ideas that he, I mean, I've seen speculation that he was left-handed. There's consequences of that and the interpretation of that I'll leave to other people. That's not my area of expertise. Yeah, some interdisciplinary research I think needs to be done there. Um, Janice, could we have another? What does the evidence show that Beethoven's immortal beloved was Anthony Brentano? Um, yeah, I mean, there are several candidates. Um, I'm, I'm not someone who's going to plump for one particular person. Um, and although I talk about it a little bit in my book, that's not what the main concern is. Um, so I think, again, other people have gone into quite a lot of detail about the possible um, who the immortal Bellavi might have been, and I don't think I want to settle on anyone this evening. Um, This looks like a question, but it's presented as a statement. Beethoven gave opus numbers to works he thought he would sell, other works he thought were inferior, he gave them not opus numbers. Um, I don't know if there's a follow-up question to that. Um, But maybe we'll wait for more in the chat. Um, Janice, could you give us another from there we go will there be any celebrations of Beethoven that Bay Area people can enjoy between now and December 16 or the end of this year Laura I'm joking that's that's (laughs) a question for me (laughs) um yes there is unfortunately it is uh as far as I know entirely online given the the situation with the virus at the moment um but we the Beethoven Center will be hosting several events in the birthday week um We have an event on uh, Monday, the 14th of December, which will be an interview between the president of the American Beethoven Society, Brian Holmes, and Alessandra Comini, who is the author of The Changing Image of Beethoven, about her new novel, The Beethoven Boomerang, which is a murder mystery. Um, So that's on the Monday. On Wednesday, we will be hosting a virtual tour of the Beethoven Center, where you can see the inside of the center and some of our collection. I'll be hosting that. And on Friday, we are going to be streaming a recital by Julian Jacobson, the president of the Beethoven Piano Society of Europe. Um, We also have a virtual exhibition that look out for that. Um, We don't have a launch date yet, but it will be within the next month. Um, So that's Beethoven. The theme is Beethoven anniversaries, which is uh, particularly pertinent this year, this anniversary year having turned out slightly differently from the way we expected. Um, and yeah, and the idea of a 3D Beethoven exhibition is already <laughs> something we could not have really envisioned before this year. Um, okay. Uh, question. If I've missed anyone's question, please post it again. I am scrolling through uh, the chat here. Um, I have another question. Was giving opus numbers to certain pieces and not others purely a statement of the value he gave to those pieces or were there commercial considerations as well? I think both. I think there was a sense in which if he gave an opus number, then it was declaring a certain ownership of those pieces. um, And that had consequences for their commercial value. 
Um, but also some of the pieces without opuses um, were things like variations on popular themes or arrangements that actually could sell and might well have had um, a commercial value as well. So it's not always straightforward. Great. I think we should think about wrapping this up. So maybe uh, maybe we'll take three more short questions. Um, so there's one in the chat here. Have you ever visited the Beethoven House in Bonn? I have. Um, and really, it's a, it's a fascinating place to visit and um, to be able to go around the city of Bonn as well and see the various musical related locations. Great. Um, was Beethoven ever completely deaf? My understanding is that there's a long, slow decline. Um, and so actually being able to say at what point he was completely deaf and my understanding from reading the work of Robin Wallace and people is actually maybe never entirely so, but very severely so. Um, but yes, I can't pinpoint it. Okay, and let's take our last question now. Why did you select Opus 130 endings for the part on quartets? Because I wanted to talk about endings altogether. And I was intrigued by the alternative finale to Opus 130. And it was another way for me to think about the publication history of these pieces, because the Grosse Fuga, of course, was the original last movement of that work, and then it gets separated out. Um, and it's a whole thing about actually performance practice and whether that quartet is done as a whole, but also the way that we talk about Beethoven's late quartets and also how they get caught up in the idea of the end of his life um, and late style. And so it was a way for me to access that. So it was one of those situations where the, the theme and the subject that I wanted to discuss in some ways determined which quartet I chose. I also really like it. Yeah, I was going to ask you that about your, your personal uh, interest in Beethoven. Um, you're a violinist, so did you come at it from the music? Is that your starting point? Yeah, that was almost always my starting point. That was how I first got to know any bits of Beethoven. Um, and one thing I have really enjoyed is returning to certain pieces and playing certainly chamber music, the piano trios and quartets. Um, I did get to play the septet um, as well, but I was playing the clarinet part because we didn't have a clarinetist. So, uh, but that was okay. It was fun. Great. Well, um, I think we should probably wrap up there. Um, this has been a really, really fabulous conversation. It's been really great talking to you about your book and uh, to open up the conversation to so many interesting things from the chat. Um, Beethoven is a subject we could talk about for hours and hours, days and days. Um, but um, yeah, I just want to say again, thank you very much, Laura, for joining us from Oxford. Um, it's now nearly nine o'clock in the evening. It's well time for a glass of wine. <laughs> uh, not so much Sorry, here. You can't me, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, thank you very much, uh, all 103 people who joined. Um, this has been a really vibrant and really interesting discussion, and I hope we can have more similar conversations in future. So thank thanks again. Take care, everyone, and um, please join us for future events like this. Take care, I'm gonna um, end the Zoom now. <laughs>